It's my honor to introduce one of my supervisor, Professor Ben Xiao, to everyone. So Professor Xiao has more than uh, 35 years of experience as a filmmaker and has taught university courses in film video production and uh, producing and uh, visual design at uh, seven universities, including the University of South California's School of uh, Cinematic Arts, the California Institute of the Arts, and the Princeton University Department of Computer Science. Ben, have, uh, ben has a per, uh, produced and uh, directed 33 films and videos, including the three MX films. He has uh, received uh, numerous uh, internationally filmmaker and awards, including the Academic Award Oscar from documentary short subject for his uh, science film, The Fly of the Gossamer Counter. Now his research focus uh, creating in fact science and uh, technology media, especially about very large and very small phenomena seen and uh, experienced on displays from hand, uh, handhold size to multi-story uh, multi high giant screen. So I first met uh, Ben uh, in Beijing in 2040 he went to attend uh, an internationally society conference. So uh, one day we just talking, what is the mobile phone uh, vision? So he just uh, pick up a box, and uh, from his uh, back, the box uh, have a small hole in the center, and uh, I don't know what happened, and uh, suddenly he put the box on his hand and uh, watching my face and uh, tell me, look, this is a mobile phone vision. So <laughs> I got it. So I want to see he always keep a childlike uh, curiosity and uh, enthusiasm uh, to watching this world. So I believe this is a very important reason why he made so many achievements. So let's welcome Professor. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. It's been a real pleasure uh, working with Shen Chen Lo as, uh, um, as a graduate student here. Um, and I've, I've never really put a box on my head. I don't do that. <laughs> no, 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 that's a different talk. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank uh, Jan for the invitation. And uh, what I would, like to contribute today is making the strange familiar and the familiar strange, which is a motto I've been using now for several decades as I try to think about showing large and small phenomenon. Um, this is, if you've had a chance to walk around the university, if you're visiting, this is the School of Art, Design, and Media, where I'm a professor now in digital filmmaking. It's just a, about five minute walk away. Um, one of the things that I have been working on is trying to think of uh, the, the world as an international place. And I've been doing titles in many, many languages. So my question is, did I get everybody? I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I apologize if it's not correct. This is from Google Translate. <laughs> uh, you, you put this in, you go like that. And you say, oh, look, there's some languages. Um, I did a version of this for uh, another title I was doing for my class. And one of my students came up and afterwards and said that I had the Chinese letters mixed. I changed them. And it's really interesting to try to be international and to uh, speak to the world and make sure. I, one of the first things I want to say is that I'm finding it's really useful to put opening languages in many, many, uh, opening titles in many, many languages all at the same time. It makes it inclusive. Everybody comes in, even as often English becomes the dominant title along the way. <laughs> so one of the things that I noticed uh, that I've learned to do over time is that I have what I think of as a time slider in my head and a scale slider. I can go up and down orders of magnitude, I can go back and forth in time, I can go in and out in scale, and I can't actually remember when I started doing this. I mean, it's just become second nature to me now. But I've learned that when I try to tell stories, I must make sure that I have everybody else grounded with these time sliders because they're not as, just not as common along the way. And I want to show you an example of a time slider 
that's really familiar to everybody. This movie, Powers of Ten. Yes, I mean, it's, I'm going to show you a little excerpt from it. This is from the Eames office, uh, 1976, I think. <clears throat> everybody familiar with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. This is one of, one of the, the most near the popular in Chicago short was films. The start this is of a Philip Morrison. Afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, the distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway, power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. What I find interesting is that we have all learned to do this, and I can do this, and everybody here is tracking what I'm doing. I'm going out to the maximum, in this particular film, it goes out to the 10 to the 22nd, 23rd, out past the galaxies, and then it zooms back in, goes all the way into the people and into the hand, and goes down to 10 to the minus in scale, down, down to protons, and back and forth. This is what I think of as a scale slider. And it's so easy to do. We begin to think of this not just at the speed of the movie, but back and forth here. At these talks, we've been starting at all kinds of scales, very, very tiny scales along the way. And part of what I have found really useful. As we draw toward the atoms attracting center, we enter upon a vat. Thank you, Professor Morrison, who was an acquaintance that I had in Boston. Um, that, that's, a, a, that's, I think of that as a scale slider. And then I, I found a sample of what I think of as a, as a time slider. And this is uh, just uh, plate tectonics for 600 million years. And I can do this. It's become very common. Everybody grabs these sliders. I find that at the level of thinking about complexity, that these are common second nature to everybody. Just you, you start at some order of magnitude along the way. And what I would like to show are a couple of samples. Um, I was walking around campus the other day. This coming weekend is uh, NTU's open house. And I saw this wonderful graphic. And I said, oh, look, this is cool. Took this picture. So here's the graphic. Here's the design. Isn't that interesting? I was saying to myself, wow, I wonder, what is this? Oh, these, these, are, these are molecules. There's some buckyballs. There's buckyballs. There's a DNA. So I took this, and I went and looked it up. And here it is online. And uh, here we are in, in some kind of scalar that's uh, close packing. Isn't that interesting? And then I, I was looking again at the, here's the molecule. And uh, I, of course, found this website. And I was scrolling down at the molecular level. And I said, oh, molecular size. What size is this? Look at this. Smallest is uh, 0.74 angstroms. The largest is 1,000 angstroms scale. This is this huge graphic here on campus. Here's DNA. What's the size of DNA? I don't even have to go and look a website up. But look at this. 85 nanometers long, 200 million base pairs. I'm seeing all these numbers right here. Here's buckyballs. Yes, 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 buckyballs. And uh, thanks to um, Wikipedia, here we are seeing the size and the scale. Where does it come down? Right over here. OK. There's nanometers in the lattice one more time. I love this, this huge sign. I was trying to figure out this one. I decided this, is must, this must be electron spin. So it's quantum spin. Um, we're still, all, all of these um, are at this fabulous scale. I decided this is actually. Uh, I thought first it was drops, so liquid. And I looked at it and I said, oh, that's kind of an odd scale for all the rest of these. What's going on here? It says it's six, six millimeters. And I went back and looked again, and I decided that's really uh, graphene being picked up by tape. And that's because that's one of the research areas that's going on here. And now we're down at the level of one layer of, um, of graphene molecules. And, um, and as I go along here, and then um, this one, I, this, is, this is a chip. And here, much thanks to um, Wikipedia updated in 2008, 
it says they've dropped to 100 nanometers. Now, obviously, they're even smaller than that right now. Um, and this is this wonderful campus sign in which we're jumping 13 scales, orders of scale at least, uh, down to the, the, um, the nano level. And we just walk by these along the way. And I'm, I'm trying to think how it is we get to come to be able to think about these and to really understand what it is we're seeing. Um, I've been making science movies um, since uh, uh, my, under, my graduate uh, degree at USC Film School. I was looking for a thesis project to do. I didn't think of myself as a science filmmaker, but there was this interesting scientist who I later met because I heard him say, well, I'd like to do this film. And the company I was working for, Churchill Films, said, we'll do it for $5,000. And I said, I'll do it. What is it? And this was with Professor Bruce Murray, who is a professor of planetary geology at Caltech. And it was about the Mariner 9 satellite. And he was on the, the planetary team with the, the Mariner 9 group. Um, let me introduce you to Professor Murray. And he was uh, at Caltech for decades. And he, he also became the director of Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he was uh, sharing the uh, being on the Mariner 9 group, satellite group uh, team as a photo manager with this other scientist named Carl Sagan. And the two of them were having a series of debates at the time which I thought was really interesting because they were debating whether or not there's life in the, in the universe. And part of it was to keep this in the front, forefront of the, the public mind. Uh, the person who was, uh, the film we made was called Mars Minus Myth. And it was the story of how uh, we put an orbiter around Mars. It was the first time all the photographs were being seen about the whole planet. And at one point, I was trying to ask, uh, Professor Murray, Bruce, I said, Bruce, so how, how do you get these ideas? And he said, well, you know, I've, I've got this PhD. I've been teaching. I, I mean, he's a very, very highly qualified person. And he says, and then I'm standing, staring out the window one day, and I get this idea. And then I go and test it against the knowledge and see if it works. And I said to myself, wow, that's what I do. Is, you know, that's the creative process. You think up an idea. It really wasn't so different than what I did. And I was able to make a very nice film about it. Um, one of the people that was, that was his, uh, postdoc at the time, not his postdoc, he was just doing his PhD, was a chap named Michael Malin, who was uh, working on the photos there. Michael Malin's now the head of uh, Malin Space Science and has made all the cameras that have been flying on all the, um, all the various Mars, the planet, all the planetary images we've been seeing in the last couple of decades have come out of Michael Malin's shop. And it's been interesting to me to already think about what happens over time as, as these different people show up. Um, that film got uh, a lot of uh, attention. Uh, much to my pleasure, um, selected by the New Zealand and Australian Association for the Advancement of Science as best science film in the world that year. I mean, it was just a movie. And it got me this really interesting job. Um, and notice this next piece. This is about getting the audience, me, up to speed. There's two groups that have to get up to speed. And one is the audience, but I have to get up to speed on the content. And I had this gig that I got from my thesis project. I, I don't mean to be dismissive, but I had this wonderful job. Uh, where I was hired to work on this brand new, at the time, television series called Nova. I was part of the original team, and I worked on program number one as the associate producer and was mentored by BBC producers for that whole season. And one of the things that happened in the second and third seasons when I became producer-director is that we would go out, we'd come up with an idea, and our science advisor, who was one of the staff, would also help us find the idea. We'd go out, we'd research it. We'd get to pitch it, and the executive producer would say, fabulous, and we'd get a go-ahead. We'd go out, shoot it. We'd come back, we'd do an edit. And then during the rough cut, Michael Ambrosino, the executive producer and the creator of Nova, would say to us, the first time he said it, I thought it was interesting. I could fix it. He said, so Ben, this is a great middle and a great end. So what happened to that beginning when you were so excited about the topic when you didn't know anything about it? And what I started recognizing is that once I started learning about it, I assumed that everybody had the same level of knowledge as I did. And this happened on all four films that I did in two years. It got to be a joke on film number three. Ben, great middle and great end. So what happened to the beginning? Of course, we always go find it, and we put it back together, and we bring the audience up to speed and bring us up to speed. But it started teaching me about the fact that I have to think about who the audience is as a broad group when I'm telling science stories. And I think it's something that we all have to do. This is, what I like to do is just look at some examples of pieces that I've done, and, um, and I want to tell you a couple of stories. So this is getting an audience up to speed. This is an IMAX film that I made called Tropical Rainforest. And I wanted to show you scale. I hope some of you have been to the IMAX theaters. They're usually um, five stories high and uh, 20 meters, uh, 70 feet across. 
and they, uh, this is the theater, and it's a, it's a wonderful flat screen theater, um, but there's also this other really world, this is the world I've worked inside of, which is the dome screen theater. And we get to be immersed inside of it, and I said, wow, I get to make this movie where I get to take us inside the rainforest. Um, so I, I had this opportunity I was, uh, to try to answer this question. Okay, and we had a wonderful, uh, some funding from this wonderful foundation, and it immediately took off on a two-week research trip. Uh, this, this is uh, biologist uh, George Stevens and uh, Kit Matthew, husband and wife uh, team who had a research station in Costa Rica. And this is one of those academic trips that, that sometimes gets to happen, you know, where a, a couple of uh, professors will take 40 or 50 people out and walk them around on whatever their level of expertise is. And the issue here was that, there, as you can see, there aren't 40 or 50 people here. Uh, this is Mike Day, who's the executive producer from the Science Museum of Minnesota, and that was the two of us. And I was the one that got to ask all the questions. You know, when there was a pause in the conversation, I got to ask the next question. And I was, as I was doing this, I was also watching George and Kit and trying to learn about what they were trying to show me. They're both evolutionary biologists, and so I was getting a sense of the deep time about the forest, but I didn't know anything about deep time, as it were. Um, so I wanted to, I had some other advisors that helped me too. This is uh, Thomas Lovejoy, and Dr. Lovejoy at the time was the Assistant Secretary for Environmental and External Affairs at the Smithsonian. Um, I had a, a book that he'd written the, the foreword on. So I'm trying to make an IMAX film on a five-story building about the tropical rainforest. And here in his foreword, in the first paragraphs, he writes, in large part, this is a tropical forest. The tropical forests of the world are bio, for biological sophisticates, a world the wonders of which only become apparent with considerable patience and background. I was no exception. And he says, the first impression was not of tremendous variety and the books of great naturalist explorers had taught me rather the mass of the vegetation conveyed a sense of green and of sameness. It was wet and warm, not blistering hot, little moved except ants. That sentence caught my attention. Little moved except ants. I'm going to make an IMAX movie about <laughs> ants. <laughs> well, I do. So, but, so this is the reality of it. One of the other uh, people that uh, gave me a huge insight in this whole project was Steven Schneider. And Professor Schneider, I, I featured him in ANOVA in 1974, and had, we've been in touch from time to time. Um, he was part of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with, with uh, Al Gore received the Nobel Peace Prize. And while I was doing my research, I was traveling back and forth across the country and, and had gone, gone down to Costa Rica for a bit on our research trip. And I stopped in uh, Boulder, Colorado to meet him and some other people I'd featured on NOVA. Um, Stephen had about 15 minutes for me, and it was just great. We sat down, and I said to him, uh, I knew his time was short, I said, so what's the big picture? And he said to me, the rapid rate of change on the planet. That's all he said. And I said, oh, it's a time story. It's a time story. And this is, it was that simple to get the whole context in place. Now, how do I do a time story? Movies allow you to do time. You can jump through time. It's really quite cool. So. Um, one of the books I read was this one. You can see the familiar stranger start showing up here, um, which gave me a whole sense of time. And then uh, Douglas Hofstetter collected all of his scientific American articles that he'd written under Metamagical Themis. And there's one in particular called Number Numbness, which is I find on the web now, which is all about thinking in orders of magnitude, putting tens in front of and behind things. And I began to very quickly learn to be able to think in tens and hundreds and thousands and millions uh, along the way. Um, so. I remember one day distinctly while George and Kit were out, George had some insect in his hand, and he stopped for about 30 seconds and just stared at it. And I was trying to figure out, this is my story, I was thinking, this is time, and how it goes by, and what's he seeing there, and how can I, how can I tell that story? And while I was working on this living in Los Angeles, I was walking with my uh, teenage daughter in Westwood, and she suddenly said, Dad, what are you doing? And I said, I'm staring at a tree. I'm looking at this tree, I'm trying to see it evolve. I'm trying to make a movie about this. <laughs> and she said to me very nicely and very quickly, well, that's easy, Dad. You put up a camera, you put it on time lapse, and you let it run for a 1,000 years, and then you get your next shot. And as soon as she said that, I went, OK, got the idea here. And there's the issue. So um, professor of uh, neurobiology, theoretical neurobiology, William Calvin at the University of Washington, wrote a book called The River That Flows Uphill. Let me just go back. And it's about a journey 
that they took on the Grand Canyon, and they use it as the background for talking about time. And so he actually, in his book, tracks time. And on this particular page, you can see that at one point on the river there at 700 million years ago, and then a couple of paragraphs later there at 500 million years ago, ah, jumping in time, jumping in time. So what uh, Calvin has done is he, gives, he puts these gifts up, and he, that's what he calls them in one of his other pieces. And this is a little excerpt from John McPhee from Basin and Range. And I found this so useful. Numbers do not seem to work well with regard to deep time. Any number above a couple of thousand years, 50,000, 50 million, will with nearly equal effect awe the imagination to the point of paralysis. And here I am. I mean, what I want to do is awe the imagination. And the last thing I want to do is put it to the point of paralysis. And that phrase gave me the insight in how to get going on the tropical rainforest film. And I want to show you uh, a, a little, the beginning of it. And uh, you see how I solved that right from the start. Tropical rainforest. Imagine. We are travelers in time. It's now 400 million years ago. Some of the most primitive of plants, the ferns, cover almost all the land. And now, a hundred million years have passed. The dominance of ferns is ending. And the trees with different leaves, with trunks and spreading branches are beginning to appear. We have burst upon a new fantastic era. Tropical rainforests have begun. Now in every IMAX film, you have to give the audience a tip or a tilt or a thrill. About to make a film about ants and trees. So here's the start. That's adrenaline hit number one. And this is adrenaline hit number two. Just before it lets. Jeffrey Holder, the narrator, say the next phrase. On the IMAX screen, this is about 10 meters across. So that face is about <laughs> that wide. <laughs> and in your face. Imagine now it's 60 million years ago. The dinosaurs have come and gone. The insects who were here before Still thrive. So that, that's all I want to show right now. So there, in the first two minutes of the film, we've gone from 400 million years ago to 60 million years ago. I've gotten down to the insect level already. Everybody knows what dinosaurs look like. I don't have to show one on the screen. We went right by that. That was all written into the script so we could get to where we were going, which is eventually get to, to, to being down with the ants. And we actually grow and shrink the audience, so you actually you, you move down in the, in the, within the world of the ants. And the part I really wanted to show you there is how the, the word imagine opens up for everybody to think about hundreds of millions of years any way you, you want to and I want to. And rather than saying it's 400 million years ago, that's one of those things that go like that, and, and how to get into the numbers by just saying imagine. And the narrator says it a couple of different times. Imagine now, imagine now. It just as, a, as, as an articulate way of just of moving along. Um, imagine we are travelers in time. That opened everything up. This is a, just wanted to show you behind the scenes. Uh, IMAX camera, 85 pound, <coughs> shoots uh, basically 4K at 24 frames a second. Huge uh, crew stuff. 
but that's not the point of this talk, nor that put the box. So I've been trying to think about how to express numbers, big numbers, and do it easily. And so here's this number, one billion. Is this, a con is this one billion for everybody? Is, 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 is a billion the phrase we can use? Yeah. It's, it, it, languages around the world actually refer to this number slightly differently. But when I was looking at it, and I'm realizing, of course, how do you describe that? Well, it's one one billion. It's 10 100 millions. It's 110 millions. You can see where this is already going. It's 1,000 10 1 millions. It's 10,000 1 thousands. It's 100,000 10 thousands. It's a million thousands. It's 10 million hundreds. It's 100 million tens. And of course, it's a billion ones. So what I find really interesting in that is this one, tens. Because tens is a number we all can relate to. And this is about bringing it down. We can all relate to it because we use this all the time. $10 bills. This is a Singapore $10 bill. Tens are something that everybody knows. And I'm just saying I found it helpful to take the, the number of a billion, which is just out of reach mentally. It's one of those paralysis things. And turn it into something, you know, it's 100 million tens. Oh, OK. I mean, that's still a little bit hard, but you can at least think about it. And 10, 10 is the number I keep finding, in particular because I have this. We all have these in our pockets. We've all handled it. It's, it's, a, it's a world reference, 10 something. You know, one's too small, but 10 tens, that's it's something I've just done in terms of breaking it down. So the reason I've titled this talk, Make the Strange Familiar and the Familiar Strange, uh, this phrase was the title of a class that uh, Professor Barbara Meyerhoff taught in the anthropology department at the University of Southern California in the 1980s um, while I was teaching there. And uh, I never met Professor Meyerhoff. I, I only met her through a documentary that a friend of mine, Lynn Littman, did called Number Our Days, in which she was doing anthropology in the neighborhood rather than going to some other places. Uh, one of uh, Professor Meyerhoff's colleagues was then associate professor Stephen Lansing who uh, we used to have dinner together because he was creating the ethnographic visual anthropology department while I was teaching at the cinema school. Um, and th this, be this became a, a phrase that, was, that I heard because of the name of the class. And I've come up with this acronym for it. And there's no way to translate this into anything else, and you can't say it. <laughs> it was M-T-S-F-A-T-F-S. And I write this on my notes because I've found when I'm trying to explain something and I can't quite figure it out, if I think about whatever the opposite or something like that, and make the strange familiar and the familiar strange, I often come up with some kind of an answer that gets me in the right direction. I want to show you one example. This is at um, Gillum Barracks here in Singapore during art space a couple of weeks ago. And this was the crowd outside some of the galleries. And one of the things that I saw and took these pictures with my cell phone was um, the moon. The moon. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for making it appear so well. This is a really low contrast shot. But there's, there's the sphere of the moon. So I looked on the web so I could find a close-up of it. I mean, the moon's a sphere. When you actually, you know, and I want to give credit to this particular website. Uh, I don't know this person, Gustavo Sanchez, but in the world of crowdsourcing, I really appreciate it because I took a look on the web for crescent moons. And I find all of these which look like this stuff down here, I mean, it's, you can't see. It's, it's, it's really a big object. It's a sphere that happens to be brightly lit on one side. So probably on that same walk I was having with my older daughter, Nara, um, when I was looking at the tree, or maybe within a few weeks later, we were out uh, in Westwood, California. which is near the West Coast. And the moon was off in the western horizon. And it looked like that. And she said to me, look, Dad, you can see where the sun is. And she was pointing over the horizon. And I went, look at that. I can see where the sun is by looking at the moon. Sun's a long ways away. It's the first time I really thought about that. And then this is in Boise, Idaho, about 10 years ago. This is at a, a concert evening. This is a, the top of a gate ball. And there's, there's the moon. And I have noticed. And I suggest you'd like to notice that any time you can see the moon any time in the night sky, the light is identical on the Earth. The moon, and the, sun, the moon and the Earth are so close together compared to where the sun is that this object tells us the same light. So this ball is, is there. And now here's a little later in the evening. I'm taking that. And then a little later. And you notice that the crescent, the shape has changed. I mean, if you go outside when you can see the moon, daylight or night, and you hold up a rock in the sun, the light will be identical on the rock as it is on the moon. 
and it's identical on the Earth. And I have found that if I draw a tangent to the top of the moon and imagine myself standing there like I'm standing on the top of the ball because I'm standing on the top of the sphere of the Earth, I will see the identical light, day or night, all the time. This is one of those things where it made the strange familiar and the familiar strange. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And so I've, I've done a little research on the web to see how this is presented. And the darn thing is, nothing's to scale. They show you these objects are, you know, this is not right. Wow, it's really hard to see this because this is, the, this is like the sort of the best image I found that shows the sun so far away from the Earth and the moon. Back. And, but the sun is really, that's, that's 93 million miles. Uh, can somebody tell me the kilometers? What is it? Uh, how many? Well, it's, 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 it's times 1.6. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. So this, this idea of understanding the reality of our real world, and there's this couple of objects we can look at all the time, and we can tell that. I mean, often the moon and the sun look the same. And I've discovered that what I really need to do is what I call riding the rotation of the planet. When I'm out doing photography, I've found, um, let me just hold that a second, that when I'm waiting for the light to come, I, I now think, okay, I'm riding the rotation. And I've discovered that the sun be down like that, and it takes about eight minutes for it to go from there to there, because it's, it's not the sun going anywhere. It's the Earth rotating. And when I uh, lived in New Mexico, I had a cupola in my uh, kitchen that was looking east towards the mountains. And I used to like to stand in the cupola and pretend like I was driving the planet east, 1,000 miles an hour, 1,600 kilometers an hour, <laughs> to the east. Right? I mean, it's, that's the way it's rolling. <laughs> And it looks like the sun is going like that, but what's really happening is we're right now flying, flying through space. And that's not even taking into account what the, what the sun is doing in the galaxy and what the, the planet is doing in a corkscrew. Um, so I came across this, uh, some time lapse from the very large array uh, in Peru. Beautiful time lapse of the night sky. And I'm imagining these time lapses are probably about eight hours long press into a few minutes, watch the Milky Way show up here. These telescopes are there for a reason, it's a really beautiful sky. Wow. So I found that image because I actually found this website on Facebook, some one of my friends posted this. I'm beginning to really think of Facebook as a crowdsourcing for information space. And it says, night sky time lapse with stars fixed shows we're just a rock hurtling through space. It's a, it's riding the rotation. And here's the movie. So this was um, taking the original movie by Francisco Scogato. And the only credit I have on this is something called Bullet People. That was the name that they put. Let me, let me actually show you it a little bigger. Same imagery. <laughs> Making still what's really still and moving what's really moving, which is the planet. That's riding the rotation of the planet. Isn't that wild? It's just so this is done in a program like After Effects, where you can lock something in, and every frame it'll lock it in and put it in the same place. And then it, uh, it, it basically is the same imagery, but just being held in place by the, 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 the huge, massive uh, star universe imagery. If we can speed up time and feel it, this is what we're doing all the time. Wow. So I have this 180 degree rule, which is pretty much anything that I do, if I do exactly the opposite, I usually come up with an interesting solution. Um, I wanted to, um, I want to thank Professor Arthur for something that he did this morning while he was doing his presentation but he did what I thought I would call a parenthetical. He took a little break when he showed us the formula, and he showed us all the details of the formula. And in some ways, he brought everybody in the audience up to some kind of speed about what the formula is about, and then he was able to keep using it on and on and on. And I, this is something I found very useful in talking about large numbers, is doing a parenthetical, even though you're talking to a, a knowledgeable audience. I don't do formulas well, I do pictures well. I was a math major until I became, decided that I really wanted to be uh, a filmmaker instead. And so, I, but I, I, I do pictures not, and I need to be brought up to speed. And everybody needs to be brought up to speed in different ways. Um, I have a, a, 
program on my computer, which actually adjusts the, the light on the screen. At night, it turns it down to 2,700 Kelvin, takes all the blue out of it, so it's easier to go to sleep at night. It actually reads where I am on the planet, and it makes this adjustment. And during the, right now, I'm using the, the daylight uh, version. Uh, my students in the evening tell me I make sure I turn it off because it turns the screen very brown. But you don't even notice it at night. And in some ways, if I think about this from an evolutionary point of view, just, you know, the blue sky is when we're awake and the black sky is when we're not. And why not give it all the blue light? Just at a really simple level. And on this screen, it tracks sunrise. But with the 180 degree rule, I found, you know, the, these words we use all the time, that's not what's going on. Earth's moving. Sun's not doing anything. And so how to have a better conversation. And I'm finding it really useful to try to have really consistent language whenever I can about the real way the planet is working. And so I like to use things like dawn and dusk instead of sunrise and sunset. And I've been doing it now for about 15 years and find it's just as easy to make the conversation as real as I can make it about what, what, what the world is like that I'm standing on and sitting on. So um, I want to show you a little bit of the rainforest film and talk about the story arc because I think it's something useful about, um, this is some of the storyboards. There's the ants. This was my original sketch for doing the titles in several languages. Of course, this partly came to me, uh, motivated me, because I had this giant, you know, five-story high screen, so this is a huge space. Here it looks kind of compressed. Um, just jumped, jumped to thought. I want to go back and make sure I get that thought. So in, in the story arc world, um, I partly learned how to, to tell stories from a poet friend of mine named Rick Maston. And Rick used to give talks. Uh, and he, would, he told me that inside of a story, you can talk about things, and then you can take people to very troubled places. And his poetry would take people to very troubled places. At the end, you have to remember to bring people back and let them sit back in the room and have some sense of forward momentum, momentum and forward motion. Um, and it, I, I use that. I've used it often in the stories. And I want to very rapidly show you parts of the rainforest. This is going to be like the time slider. Uh, but so this is going through time. We hit the insects pretty soon. You'll see. Um, and this is kind of giving us a sense of the forest and what we're in it. And then as time is going on, more species show up. In this particular story, to do evolution and, and tell the story, when the different species, like the birds show up, that's the first time we hear bird sounds. When the frogs hear, show up, that's the first time we hear and the amphibians. Um, that was part of the soundtrack. Um, part of what was really wonderful about making this film was that we found a national, United Nations uh, site in northeastern Australia, which is a, a preservation site that was full of those huge fern trees. And I learned from my biologists that the fern trees have been on the planet for half a billion years. And I could suddenly say, I could take my camera and point it through time and shoot something that looked the same now as it did then. They sort of slipped through cracks of time, as have all these different species along the way. And so this whole story moves along, finding different species. There's the ants. Now notice one of the things that happened right here. We're in a, a big wide shot. Then we go down. We actually shrunk the audience right here. Um, and the soundtrack is, has been shrunk. We come back out. If you study that ant, the ant, ant every stage in that ant's life is uh, in it. Then humans show up. We're tool users. Uh, we're just like the ants and all the rest. We, we just happen to have extended our skills. And then this, in this storyline, you can see this is a fairly uh, difficult situation here, uh, what's happening to the forests. And then we have researchers come in and take a look at it and try to track it, much like uh, getting the periodic chart. This is about biologists making sure that they have the whole uh, biology chart from the forests as it's changing. We sit in present time for a little bit. And then I want to just take you to the, to the very end here um, and show you the, the epilogue. This is all in the present time, which in the 40-minute story takes about uh, 10 minutes. And then we, here's, So we got to a fairly... This is a story that began 400 million years ago. It's taken all that time to build the tropical rainforest.
let's imagine that it's 50 years from now. There's much we have learned already about nature, sometimes using it to suit our ends. In this, we are just part of evolution, no better than the insects, and no worse. But time and evolution gave us conscience. We can understand what's going on. We can see the consequence of action. We can learn why species go extinct. We have the tools and better. We have foresight. Future is a time that we can change. This uh, storyline was something I put together. Uh, my BBC mentor, Simon Campbell-Jones from Nova, I brought him in to write the narration and he wrote th the very specific details. And that line that he put at the end is that we have foresight, future is a time that we can change. I find such a powerful idea. And it was the whole point of putting it into, into that context. When he showed up, uh, just a note, he, he showed me some sample narration and he said, uh, do you like this? And I said, sure, yeah, and, and a couple sentences. And he said, well, I'm writing it in non-rhyming iambic pentameter. Da -da 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 Would you like me to do that for the entire story? And I said, yes. All the narration you heard, not only is it doing content, not only is it fitting with the storyline, but it's all written in non-rhyming iambic pentameter. Because it's this wonderful, you settle in with the voice and you, and you move along with it. It was nothing I could have created on my own, but it's th th this kind of thing that's a collaborative piece. Um, I want to talk about visualizing scale. Uh, the good news was I started doing my math when there were slide rules. And I must say that the wonderful thing about slide rules, I can hear that some of you have had it too, is you can actually look and see what logarithms look like. You can see this ramp scale. It's like, wow, isn't that cool? I mean, you, know, you can see the spaces. You can physically see the change along the way. And I think it's really useful to have those kinds of things around even as we get inside. So the powers of 10 film. There was a predecessor to it, which was the first time that the Eames group built this. This was done in 1968. And one of the things that uh, Charles Eames did when he had new employees come in and want to work on films is he gave them, I, I can't pronounce the person's name, Keith Voice, am I saying that right? From the Netherlands, he had done a Powers of Ten book in the early 1960s. And he, he used to give that to new filmmakers, Charles Eames did, and said, can you make a movie out of this? And the person he gave it to was Judith Pernofsky, who's the daughter of Jacob Pernofsky, the Ascent of Man. And Judith um, solved the problem. And they made this test piece. So this is uh, just another piece, of, uh, version of the same thing we saw earlier, but I want to show it to you. Um, So this is all the volume we have on this particular version. The sleeping man is having a picnic on a Miami golf course. As we back off, the clock start, and we accelerate in such a way that after 10 seconds have elapsed, we will be exactly 10 times farther away. Now the scene is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds it so will the, be 10 the times The color film is in the Chicago. This was in, in the center and will remain there long Miami. And notice there's some other charts going on as well that are all useful and interesting. Um, I just want to go back and I, I want to just uh, just catch it here. So it's the same story, but you can see that there's a number of things that haven't been by this time. Electron microscopes haven't really shown up to a degree, and all this whole section is all done in sketches. Um, both of these films are, are online available. Um, and th that's Keith's, how do I say that? 
Wookie, thank you. Yeah, case, thank you. And uh, this was the group that, that, that solved it and put it together at that point. Now, um, I want to do a little repeat of something here. I want to just show you here. This is the film we just watched. Um, and there's something that's happened in the world of digital that I would like to point out to all of you, because you do presentations like I do presentations, which is <laughs> when, when the world was filmed the and- Near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. <clears throat> Uh, we, we had control of our screen systems, and we knew what things looked like. <clears throat> and I want to particularly use this example, because this obviously is a film that depends on this meter square object. So <clears throat> when I came in on Saturday uh, and Sunday and tried to do this, Mr. Wong helped me get this adjusted. And What's happened these days with new digital projectors, I'd like to point out to you, is that they come in all kinds of different scales. They come in 3.4, they come in 16.9, and in some ways, it automatically shows up. Can you put up, do you have your, your button, sir? Yes, sir. Can you show us this in 16.9, please? Would you change the picture to 16.9? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you change it right now, please. You know, show it to us in 16.9, make it wider. Go up to picture. So these, these projectors actually need adjusting. No, you, you make it 16, 16.10. Change it to 16.10. So 16.10. Yes, yeah, so thank you. I got it. Now I see it. So look what that just happened. If I just come in and shown this piece, it's a rectangle. This is about a meter square. And I'm suggesting, if you take it back to 3.4, please, sir. OK. So I just suggest to you that as we try to bring people up to speed and audiences up to speed, we actually have to learn some technology. Because tech, the projectors, everything is getting more uh, scattered in terms of, it, it's, it's, it's digital. Everything is getting more, more detailed. And one of the things that's happening is that often projectors have to be set specifically for how you want your, your presentation to go. Especially if it's something like this. I wanted to use this one in particular because you gotta have a cube. You gotta have a square. I mean, you gotta, it's gotta be a metric square. It can't be a, a rectangle. I could casually be showing this. And even, so there's some really interesting um, uh, stories that have been told uh, mathematically. I hope you know about the murmurs of the earth. This is about the, the Voyager records and all the details that were put in where everything was measured by the half-life of a hydrogen atom, which seems to be throughout the world. Um, I'm gonna, I just want to show you a couple. Um, I found and met David Christian through finding the big history project. And I, I find it really useful because you can actually go through it and it does orders of magnitude, much like uh, orders of magnitude happens in, in books like this in a very effective way as a tool. Um, thank you. Thank you for finding a way. And I want to point out to you how well designed that is. And I've had the opportunity to talk to Professor Christian. And like he, I don't do all the work. He doesn't do all the graphics. And I want to urge everybody that as you do presentations, especially about large and small scale, that you get some graphic designers in who are experts in giving the story a way of, of being seen. It, 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 I think now it's becoming, I, mean, I have a whole pile of visual communication students over at the School of Art, Design, and Media who are all going to be really skilled in how to use Photoshop and After Effects and a number of tools that even as I know how to use them, I'm not as good as somebody who grew up in the digital nation. And in a digital world, a nation is the wrong place to think to call it. Um, but I want to strongly urge that you, uh, along the way in doing presentations, you find designers that help you do it. I've discovered that I've had to, to do things for audiences, which I like to uh, call from 2 to 92. My mother will be 92 next uh, two weeks from now. And so I, I've, I've used this number for quite a while. And now I actually know somebody who's 2 to 92. This is a book called The Unschooled Mind by Howard Gardner. Uh, previously, uh, Professor Gardner, who's at Harvard, wrote a book called Frames of Mind, all the different varieties of ways of thinking people do. So we all, you know, I was just telling you, I do visual. I don't do uh, words as easily. I don't do um, f uh, formulas as easily. I can't say formulas. I don't do formulas as easily. But it's OK. I have others who are specialists. Uh, my daughters can hear a piece of music, and they can repeat it instantly in all the octave pitches. I can't do it at all. We, we all have our own proclivities. Um, and uh, Howard Gardner in this book along the way, there's this particular two things that I thought were really useful. The way people understand the world, it says normal all normal children raised in a reasonable environment can be expected to attain 
two ways of representing knowledge. And one is a sensor motor way of knowing, dating from infancy in which one comes to know the world primarily through the operation of one's sense organs and one's actions in the world. And then there's this other way of knowing the world, which is a symbolic form of knowing dating from early childhood, in which com one comes to know the world through the use of various symbol systems, chiefly those that have evolved over the millennium in the culture in which one happens to live. We don't choose our parents. <laughs> we don't choose what world we were born into. And the variety is as wide as complexity is trying to calculate. And I find that having to think about that and understand those two elements all the time makes it very useful in terms of trying to make sure I can reach an audience appropriately with my content. If I'm talking to specialists, that's one audience. But if I'm talking very broadly, and my opportunity has been to make films and videos that need to play in theaters where grandparents come in with their grandchildren, and they sit for 40 minutes, and they want their grandchildren watching as attentively as they do, how to make everybody there. If the grandchild is restless, that's not going to work. If the grandparent doesn't understand what the movie's about, they're going to, be out, they're going to get tense with the child. It's, all that kind of stuff has to go on in the storytelling. And along the way, there was, uh, this is a, a periodical that comes out. This is from 1983. And it's a whole issue on scientific literacy. And when I read this, there was one particular thing by an author named uh, Mary Bud Rowe. And Professor Rowe wrote about characteristics of low fate and high fate control views. And I found this, this section quite useful. That there are, there are, as she was noting, two ways of viewing the world. And you can see right at the beginning, low fate has chance, can't influence the odd, can't influence the odds, high fate, no use to try, you can't make a difference, low fate, try things, learning from experience, high fate. And it goes all the way down the list. And I can say that often the world of researchers and, and, and us in the audience fall into this high fate region, but we have to speak across along the way. And part of what my overview point here is, is about understanding that we have to make sure we open up and, and talk, about our, um, talk about our content, understanding that there's a variety of habits of mind. You can see um, wh one of the uh, books that's been very helpful to me um, is Emotional Intelligence. Um, and uh, there's a, a series of books. These are written by uh, Daniel Goleman, who is a psychology writer for the New York Times. And uh, this is from a high school yearbook. This is me doing a show. Uh, Dan Goleman was the student body president in the high school that I went to in Central California. And so I come to this book for a couple reasons, but I highly recommend it as a way of getting grounding. And for my own company and my own work, I actually have created a manifesto about the kinds of films we make and the way we tell our stories. And I just want to start by saying, you know, I, I put these in order so I can talk to groups. Gender neutral, non-aggressive, multicultural, thought-provoking, intellectually encouraging, role model expansive, economically neutral, non-elitist, non-abusive, cognitively healthy in worldview, physically accurate, experientially accurate, and those appealing to multi-generational audiences made with 10-year shelf life worth seeing twice, that's good business, right? I mean, you want people to come back and ask your stories again, which take off and soar in the audience's imagination. Um, I originally wrote these as all the things I didn't want my movies to be, and uh, my wife said, oh, you should probably make them more positive. And so uh, gender neutral is right at the top of the list. Um, I wanted to note that this is my, my crew, and much like I was saying, earlier that I have a group of people that help me put these things together. Um, this isn't something that I individually just do myself. And one of the things that I have done since working on NOVA in the 1970s is one of the other main staff has always been female. I'm male, somebody's female, the world is 53, 47%. I'm actually in the minority. Um, I gotta make sure my stories are reaching across the board. This is uh, Marion White, who originally started working with me on NOVA as a production assistant. Went to business school, and by the time we did the Rainforest film, she was with me, the producer of the project, and making sure that it was cognitively clear, gender neutral across the way. And I'd like to urge everybody to make sure that in discussions that you have, that you get feedback across the sexes, male and female, as, you're doing, as we do our presentations. It's been one of those things that I've had to be really clear about. Um, so I wanted to note that uh, this, I call this section, one person changes everything. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Paul McCready and his team who built the Gossamer Condor airplane. It's the first human-powered airplane in history to have flo flown successfully. I met him when he just had plans. I was able to figure out why it was going to be, the, the odds were very high that he was going to do it that nobody else had done. Um, 
And that's a longer story, which I'm not going to talk about right now, except to say that before the Gossamer Condor was built, human-powered flight was considered impossible. And after it happened, it's now real. One person and his team changed everything in the world. And I find that every one of us, one person in the world, changes everything all the time. Um, this film has now been out for um, 40 years now, almost. And it's actively being still used in, in schools to teach about phys uh, physics and engineering. And it's a story about, importantly, about one person changing everything. Um, one of the other people that I met while working on the Gossamer Condor film, uh, Paul McCready is a Caltech graduate. Um, his next door neighbor was someone that many of you know, uh, Murray Gelman. And uh, Professor Gelman was sometimes coming out when they were working on the Gossamer Condor on weekends and working as one of the wing holders. And we got to be acquainted because we were filming everybody along the way. And over the years, I was able to stay in touch with Professor Gelman. And I was living in Albuquerque. And I had a great idea for a movie, which I'm still I think it's a great idea about making a movie about music. Why is music music? And the one thing I really wanted to do was I wanted to not have that waveform you always see that says, this is what sound looks like, right? That's not what sound looks like. That's kind of, that's an amplitude. But it's not what sound looks like. And I wanted to animate what sound looks like. I wanted to see molecules bumping into each other and transmitting from the, from the musical instrument into our ear. And I was living in Albuquerque, Sandia National Labs was there. They had huge computing resources in the uh, mid-90s. And I talked to them. And I said, listen, I want to show air pressure moving. And uh, can I show a waveform going? And can I like, put a, a million molecules, million dots on the screen? And they said, yeah. And I said, great. And uh, along the way, I had the opportunity to have a luncheon with Professor Gilman in Santa Fe up the road. And we were chatting, and I was excited about my project. And uh, I was suddenly saying to myself, listen, this is a person who actually knows the size of molecules. <laughs> he knows the size of quarks. I mean, he really knows the size of things. And I casually said to Professor Gilman, I said, so I've got these folks in Sandia, and they can do 100 million molecules on the screen bouncing. I just exaggerated it by a couple orders of magnitude. Wow. So how big would that be? I mean, how much? And he looked at me and he said, well, all those 100 million molecules would fit there. There's 100 million air molecules there. And I, I tell you this story because I think this is part of the issue that we have in dealing with orders of magnitude. It's, I mean, this is as clear as I've ever seen the physical nature of this mass of, of density that we're swimming in all the time. And I, and I offer you that story. Um, I haven't made the film in part because I can see how big of, how many, uh, 300 billion. Um, I've uh, spent some time learning how to think exponentially, and I've decided I needed to have a presentation on how to do that, and so I'd like to show you my presentation on orders of magnitude. Uh, this is Macworld Magazine from 1986. Uh, the, the PC, excuse me, the PC had been out for uh, two years as a desktop, and the, the Apple had been out for six years, and then the Mac came out in 1984. And this was the first time business was being featured, uh, showing that this, 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 this tool was really useful. And I'm the first filmmaker ever featured in Macworld magazine. <clears throat> there I am in 1986, talking about Hollywood. And one of the things that I realized is, is, is the Mac at the time had three programs on it. It had a word processor, it had a graphics program, and Microsoft had made something called Multiplan, which became Excel. And I could actually do a spreadsheet. And with that spreadsheet, I actually did a budget for an IMAX film, which showed how we could move the money around. The spreadsheet that was given to me was typed and written and locked. And all of a sudden, I had this malleability that computational capacity gave me. And from that malleability, I actually got a job doing IMAX films. I you know, say, look, if we did this number here, we changed this amount of days. It was so wonderful along the way. Um, so 1986, uh, computer capacity has changed. And um, this audience may know Gordon Moore, Moore's Law. I'm sure some of you have heard about Moore's Law. Um, often when I'm talking to especially students these days, uh, Moore's Law is in the background. So here's the thing, uh, Gordon Moore, uh, founded a couple of computer companies in the 1950s and 60s. One was called Fairchild Semiconductor. The next one was called Intel. And in 1965, 
He posited, based on what he understood about chip manufacturing, that chip density was going was to double every year while costs would stay flat. And the part that's not often mentioned is the part about cost staying flat. Now, I'm sure there's R&D, but the manufacturing costs were going to stay flat and chip density was going to double. Those are exponential numbers. So I put number one as 1984 when I first got my Mac, and I ran a spreadsheet to say what happens with exponential numbers. And they are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. We know these numbers, right? 5, 12. We see them all the time. 10, 24. That's why we see them is because they're exponential numbers. And I was basically, as you can see, just multiplying and running the numbers down. This, I did this first in 2012. I actually have to add 2014. That tells me, theoretically, just with Moore's law, chip density is doubling in 22 cycles. The computer I have now, at every point, can do a million times more than the computer I had in 1984. That's my way of looking at it. I mean, that's what chip density, that's what the computational capacity is telling me. Wow, isn't that wild? Chip density, I mean, that, and that's, that's just theoretical. And that's become, you know, I, I've, uh, uh, Professor Moore had the opportunity to get a, a doctorate. He's, that's why he's Professor Moore at Princeton while I was teaching there. And um, I heard secondhand that he'd never thought that Moore's law was going to become Moore's law. He just made a comment. But it's become this thing against which computer capacity has been working for decades now. It's keep up with Moore's law, keep up with Moore's law. I remember getting to visit Intel uh, with one of my Princeton faculty members. Uh, took me to, to visit the researcher, and they were down to 0.13. Uh, angstroms for the width of, of the wire, and they wanted to get down to 0.11, and that was a big issue against the heat, and they, in fact, did that, and they keep doing, Moore's Law keeps on working along the way. So I want to show you Moore's Law in action. Okay, there's my first Mac. <laughs> there's my MacBook Pro, actually. There's some other Macs I've had. Actually, there's some more Macs. This is my Mac Museum. And I've realized, as I look at this collection of plastic and copper, that this is Moore's law. I've been, I've been buying computers based on Moore's law. Capacity keeps changing, and I keep needing that capacity along the way. So I decided to do the numbers, and thank you to Google and the internet. I found here's the first Mac. I bought mine in February 2nd. This, was, uh, this came out January 24th. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Carrie Liu, who was a uh, doctor, doctorate from uh, Caltech, had written a book on the MacBook called the Mac. It was 1984, and he had always poo-pooed computers, he thought they were nothing. And he always said, they're just tools, don't worry about it. And in the, in the opening chapter of that book, in the introduction, he wrote, you know, um, they asked me if I'd write this book about this computer coming out next year. I said, who'd want to spend a year on a computer? It would be out of fashion. They showed me the computer, here's the book. And that's all I read in the front of it, and I went out and bought my computer. I said, okay, that's what it is. So, here's what they had. That was the memory. That was RAM memory, that was so cool. And that's how much the drive was. And there was no hard drive. So this is actually the computer I'm using now. This is beyond my collection. And now you don't have to go look for it on the internet, because you just look for it. And it tells you this one has 8 gigabytes of RAM. And it has a 500 gigabyte solid state hard drive. Look at that. Moore's Law. <laughs> so here's the other part of Moore's Law. That's how much the computers cost. Yes, there's, a, there's actually time between them. And yes, this computer cost less, but with all the dongles I had to buy because it's so small, you end up paying the same amount of money. That's what computers have cost. For the, for, yeah, it's just what computers have cost. Whew. So this is a book called Computer Lib. This was written by Ted Nelson, 1973. I got this while I was working on Nova. This is this really fabulously interesting book, long before there was PageMaker. Ted Nelson creates hyperlinks which then become links on the net, among other things that he's done. He wrote this book, and it has two sides, and it's got two stories. It's fabulous, full of little bits and pieces. Here's one sample. This was the Cave of Plato. Look at this. This was sketches in 1973 or something or other. Cool. Here's the page that really caught my attention. Stop the presses. $3,500. Run. Don't walk. The $3,500 gets you 16K of memory. The API program, a keyboard, and a numerical keyboard, and a plasma display cassette, which apparently stores and retrieves arrays by name called by program, is $1,500 extra. Run, don't walk. That's so cheap. It's the same $2,500, $3,500. This is 
Yeah. And then down the bottom here it says the rumor that IBM has an API, APL on a chip inside a Selectric typewriter, which therefore does all the things with no external connection to any external computer, remains unsubstantiated. The rumor has been around for some time. In 1982, I bought a Selectric typewriter with 16K of memory for $2,500 because it could do one page absolutely free. I could type it out, erase that memory, type the second page. It'd be no, no, no errors. Type it out, erase that memory. It was worth the $2,500, probably because I'd read this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I decided to run Moore's Law on this. You know, there's my first deal, but why don't I take the numbers, take this 128 and see what happens if I do Moore's Law. And there it looks 18 cycles in. We've got to actually gotten to eight gigabytes of RAM. It's just Moore's Law in some ways. Yes, it's technology. Yes, it's a lot of research. I'm not denying any of that, but, but it keeps on going. So <clears throat> there's Moore's Law. And there's Moore's Law. Yeah. <laughs> so after I did this talk for a couple of times, I said to myself, whoa, this is interesting. I'm starting in 1984 when I got my first computer. But have I taken into account the rest of the world? What about when Gordon Moore started his count? And what about a 20-year-old who's in one of my classes who had a computer for 10 years? What would happen if I looked at their Moore's Law? So this is starting Gordon Moore's. 1965, starting this student at 1 in 2004. And I look and I say, oh, there's my 2014. There's Gordon Moore's 2014. And there's the student's 2014. So while I'm seeing a million times more here, what Gordon Moore in his lifetime has already seen is 8 billion times as much capacity in Moore's law. And what the student has seen is 128 times as much capacity as when they first got their computer, which is like nothing. But they start. 10 years ago, when, when Gordon Moore is already on. So I find this really interesting to try to, be, to make sure I'm thinking across generations as I look at this. And I decide to see when would the student actually get to my capacity, and when, I, when would I get to Gordon Moore's capacity, which is 2034. And I wish Mr. Moore the longest life possible, and his ideas will keep on going. And look what happens. If, and Moore's law is going to keep going in some form or another. It, in 2034, 20 years from now, he's got 70. What is it? Fast billion? Trillion. trillion. 70 trillion times as much density. We've been talking, a number of us have been talking here about what the future is like. This is really interesting. Every time there's a doubling now, in my version, it goes from 1 million to 2 million to 4 million to 8 million. The capacity just keeps, the, the exponential numbers are really useful to know to be able to think about to try to do some forecasting and, to, and, and thinking about the world. That's the IMAX camera, 24 frames a second, 30. Um, 4K by 4K, and this is my new GoPro. 30 frames a second, 4K by 4K. <laughs> and two thirds of the, of, of the GoPro is actually a battery. The rest of it is just, just the, the computational capacity is tiny. So I just want to end by saying the future is a time that we can change. Um, when I did the Rainforest film, it came out in 1992, and one of the things that happens with ideas is that they spread. I happen to be in an industry where I can somewhat see the, the spread of the ideas. Every idea that all of us are working on, in whatever our field is, the ideas are spreading and spreading, and they go on uh, in ways that we don't necessarily understand. I, I happen to have some pieces of tracking here from mine. Um, the film opened in February 2nd of 2000, 1992. This is two weeks later. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning critic Joe Morgenstern had seen the film at a screening, and he loved it, and he wrote a full page on the story. And at the very end, he wrote this last paragraph. The film makes its own trenchant comments on interconnections. We're just part of evolution, the narrator says, no better than the insects and no worse. Indeed, the chainsawing humans seem no more or no less, how do I say that word, rapacious? Thank you. Then the leaf-eating ants, the ants would also strip the forest bare if they could. But there's one crucial difference, which provides the only reason for any optimism. The ants, having been originally programmed to do what they do, remain eternal prisoners of their program's rules. As for us, the narration notes, we have the tools and better. We have the foresight. The future is the time that we can change. This blew me away. This is in the Wall Street Journal going all around the world when the film was running in one theater in the whole world at that point, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And there it was. We have the future is a time that we can change. And I'm, I'm just showing this because it's really interesting to see the way ideas move. Uh, a film, this film, among others, has been repurposed for HD because it's got such high resolution. Um, 
it's turned into Blu-ray. Um, I just recently, the film I was showing you is on uh, iTunes, and this idea keeps coming and going. Uh, so last year, I'm reading um, one of uh, Joe Morgenstern's uh, Wall Street Journal movie reviews, and he often, if he reviews something, if he finds that there's something that ties in with it, uh, he had an IMAX film he tied in, all of a sudden, here was this little rewind. I went, whoa, what's this? And there, in 2014, he ends it by saying, the future is a time that we can change. I show you this uh, to show you that ideas get magnified in all sorts of ways. Uh, you know, I, in, in making these stories, I happen to be able to attract some of them, but every one of us can track these, our ideas all along the way. Um, thank you for uh, going on this journey with me. And I want to wish you uh, make the strange familiar and the familiar strange all the time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I want to thank all the folks who have provided me with research grants over the period of time. Whoops, I didn't leave that on the screen long enough. You can't, you can't take your researchers off. Thank you. Thank you. Question over here in the middle. Could you? Thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, you spent a lot of time talking about the images, and you spent a bit of time talking about the spoken uh, commentary to yes. the forest. I, I, I wonder if you could tell us something about the music that you used in the movie. I mean, you had the, 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 the flutes and the drums at the beginning, and there was the wimble wax on yes, the end. Yes, 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 yes. Um, the, the soundtrack sound design was done by a colleague of mine named Michael Stearns. Um, he's done, most recently, uh, there's a feature film called Samsura that's been out, but he, he's done a number of pieces of, of really wonderful world music. Um, he was thrilled to join the project. He traveled with us when we were on location, and while we had 14 people carrying the huge camera, he had a then brand new digital recorder, and he had a stereo microphone that looked like Darth Vader's head that had microphones ears apart. And while we would all be shooting, he would go out and spend hours recording daytime, nighttime in, in, the, in the environments. And every time, the, the film goes all the way around the world, the new world and old world tropics. And we constantly made sure that the soundtrack bed was consistent as the visuals changed, even though you don't know this is happening. It's, it's going. And while he was in Costa Rica, he got together with a, a group of musicians, which were the clay flutes and all that sort of thing. And he recorded a whole bunch of musical schemas. And then he interwove those together and moved the pitches around in the soundtrack to make it all work as a, as a musical piece. So it's all equatorial music. And I chose Jeffrey Holder, who's Tony Award-winning actor, often known as uh, Willie Shakespeare and Dr. Doolittle, the movie, and a Broadway actor. Uh, he's from Trinidad, and he has this really interesting equatorial voice, very professional voice. I wanted everything to be of that, that region. I've often seen films which take you to different regions, and then the violins and the symphony comes up, and then the voice like mine comes in and starts talking, and it's not appropriate, it's not culturally appropriate, it's not uh, uh, geologically appropriate, I mean, <laughs> geography appropriate, and so I, I've, I've worked very hard to make that happen, um, and I was really delighted that he was a good actor because he could actually deal with the non-rhyming iambic pentameter as a part of it. So, and then um, Spike Lee, the director, had done a documentary with Ladysmith Black Mambazo, and they had done a choral version of uh, Lion Sleeps Tonight. And my script had said, at the end, the voices of the people sing. And I heard that track and licensed it, and immediately licensed it and got the rights to do it. Um, at, at the end in the, in the uh, end credits, the, the birds and the insects of the forest get a credit for the sound effects. Uh, but the first NOVA program I did was called Why Do Birds Sing that I produced and directed. And I worked with Charlie Walcott, who later became the head of the Cornell Ornithology School. And he brought the project to us. And as we were, we had several different species of birds. We were focusing on red-winged blackbirds. Um, it's, it's been a while, I can't get all the names. But he said to me, you know, we're going to make this movie, and there's going to be a lot of people who are experts in birds watching and listening to this movie. So make sure that the soundtrack is accurate, not only in the foreground, but in the background. Because I, I, like many filmmakers, have had a habit of just pulling, you know, give me a bird, put that in the track, and it's a mockingbird, or it's somebody, something from Australia. 
And in that film, we had all the foreground and background sounds accurate to every location. I did that in 1974, and it's become grounded into my, into my way of doing this. None of this is ever discussed when a film is shown, but I feel it's really important to make it as real as possible to real experience. So that when you go out, you know, th th that's why it becomes the illusion that it works so well. Just a, a comment on that. Yeah, yeah. We were very amused in Australia watching an American uh, jungle a television show in the 60s that had a kookaburra in the background. <laughs> Quite inappropriate. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, uh, Ross Williams is a new professor uh, teaching sound over in our school, and he comes from Australia. And he said, I'm, I'm forever being, I, I hear kookaburras in every soundtrack. You hear that in morning doves all the time, because they, they, they happen to be soundtrack pieces. But part of what's happened in the digital world, which is really fabulous, is now crowdsourcing has become an ability to get sounds from all over the planet. And uh, Ross was saying to us at a uh, film, digital filmmaking group meeting, that he's part of a, a group of about 110 sound designers from around the world. And once every other month, they do a project. And one, one month, they do crowd sounds. And everybody around the planet goes out with their high quality digital recording and records crowds. And, and then they put it into a, a database that everybody can draw upon. And next time, they do ocean sounds or water sounds or something like that. And now there's, these resources are coming up where you can find accurate, high-quality sound. You know, and, and, and they, as a group, exchange it, and, and, and they all uh, benefit from it. And so you know, that, that's one of the kinds of collections that, in fact, I think that some anthropologists would find it really useful. That they're, you know, because they, they catalog it because they're in the, in the sound business. They know right where it came from and when it came from. And it's, it's all logged in in a, in a very similar way to where uh, uh, various scientists would be doing the same kind of thing out in the field. Yeah. Yes. As somebody who is uh, struggling with using foresight methodologies to improve decision making in the present to affect changes in the future, can you talk a little more about the educational processes that you are using uh, to, well, to enforce that kind of concept? Um. Two, two, different, two different levels of it. Uh, I showed you the number of uh, different uh, researchers I had access to along the way. Um, the Science Museum of Minnesota, which is the executive producer of this project, also put on and had funding from National Science Foundation to do an educational outreach about the, the whole piece along the way. And while we were looking at and talking with the evolutionary biologists about what's, what's unique about humans, somewhere in that conversation, the word foresight came up. And we have foresight. And foresight seems to be a behavior that is unique amongst humans as we at least, uh, we'll, we will learn other things, I'm sure, as time goes on. But that seemed to be a really specific thing that we can do. And I suddenly realized that that was a, a hopeful idea. And so part of, as I was, the, the theme is you start high and then you get to a problem. But you have to, you, if you just leave the problem, then everybody goes, thanks. <laughs> and you have to come out at the end. And you have to come back up. And so when I, when I recognized that, then we, we had foresight, and the future is a time that we can change. And I credit Simon Campbell Jones with giving me those precise words at the end. You know, it was interesting, he said in the Wall Street Journal Review, it says, the future is a time that we can change. When in fact, the narration says, future is a time that we can change because it's iambic. You know, it's, and uh, I should write to Mr. Morgan Stern sometime and say, thanks, Joe. But <laughs> But so, so um, that's, that's all built into the, the, this whole process of, you know, the advisors would come in during the editing. Um, my, my skill is, is putting the stories together. And I, have, I love it that I get to work with, with experts and get to work with, you know, uh, get, get to, I, I worked for, for three months on the Cosmos series at the beginning as a development producer. And I was also finishing the Gossamer Condor film at the same time. So I was doing 12 hour days and 12 hour nights. And, <laughs> The news is I finished the Gossamer Condor film and got to spend three months with Carl Sagan and the team. And uh, that grounded me in the cosmic calendar and scale and size. And I'm forever wanting to find the experts to help me. I, I, I've had, I, I love being in universities. That's one of the reasons, because the, the intellectual ideas are here and, and we can find them and, and ground them. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, the, the, the Science Museum in particular is, is, is an educational institution, as are science museums around the world, like the Singapore Science Center. And they are very, very grounded in making sure that there's a good educational quality in all the work that they do. You know, 
So the Rainforest film played in, in three and six month periods somewhere in the, around the planet. It's in eight languages. And it, in fact, played in Singapore as, as part of it. Um, it, it it's around and in, in the way of the distribution, it actually played for nine and a half years consistently. And that's when I showed you my, my um, manifesto. Having a 10 year shelf life is really an important thing, I find. If you make something where it's last year's news by the time it comes out, it doesn't have impact, it doesn't have forward usefulness. And so it's one of my, my mandates to make sure things have forward usefulness and can show. Um, and let, let me tell just one quick Singapore story, um, which is that when we were shooting in uh, northeastern Australia, and then we went to Borneo to film, uh, we had a weekend off in between those two shoots, and we, took it, we had it off here in Singapore. This was my resting room uh, for, the, for the crew. And uh, then uh, head of the Singapore Science Center, Leo Tan, uh, who's at uh, NUS, uh, National Nanyang, um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, National University of Singapore, yeah, NUS, NUS. For, for those outside the community, I apologize to NUS. Um, he took us all around town, and then we and Omnimax crew, who were really tired and we'd been shooting, actually went and watched Omnimax films in the Singapore Science Center. And one of the films was done by a colleague of mine. And it was, uh, had somebody doing rock climbing. And they were climbing this half face of this mountain, which in the United States is in a national park called Yosemite. It's very well known in the United States. And I'm listening to the narration, watching the, wall, the, the, the rock climber. And the narrator is saying, here in Yosemite, da 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 And I'm looking around in the audience. And I'm saying to myself, is anybody in this audience, who, who knows what Yosemite is? How many people have traveled? And so afterwards, I asked Dr. Tan, what do people think? The narration says Yosemite. He said, well, simple, Bugs Bunny. And I said, what? <laughs> Yosemite Sam, Bugs Bunny, right? And it was like, wait a minute, what just happened here? What's, what, what, what cognitive link got missed? And that's actually when I realized I needed to do the titles in all the languages. That's where I, that started my, my ambition that I've been now talking about for quite a while, about trying to be as encompassing as possible along the way, and to make sure that things like that aren't red, little red flags. That's all part of the educational mandate. You know, because the, the thing about, uh, about films and the thing about all kinds, anything we write, it, it, in some ways, it gets abandoned out into the world and it, gets, it shows up on somebody else's desk in 10 years and has, does it take into account what somebody else might be thinking? That's what I so. hope that's helpful. Thanks. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, want, I want to thank Jan and, and the Complexity Group and Paralimus for inviting me to be one of the speakers here. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure being in the, in the audience in the crowd. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thank you, sir. OK. And the photographer has to take a picture.